All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, today's talk is part of the um, Transnational Feminism, Solidarity and Social Justice lecture series, uh, which is also a project funded by the Open University, no, Open Society and University Network, Osun. Um, my name is Agata Lisiak. I'm Associate Professor of Migration Studies at Bard College Berlin. And uh, the host of today's talk, it's with great pleasure and honor that uh, in my role as a host, I will now introduce Professor Srila Roy, who is one of the members of our awesome project, I want to stress, uh, which is uh, a delight for all of us involved. Uh, professor Srila Roy is an associate professor of sociology and head of development studies at the University of Witwatersrand in uh, Johannesburg, where she also leads uh, the Governing Intimacies Project, a project that supports a new generation of researchers in gender and sexuality studies in India and South Africa, but Governing Intimacies is also the title of a book series that Srila co-edits um, with Nikki Falkov, another uh, WITS scholar at the Manchester University Press, and earlier this year, uh, together with uh, another amazing scholar, Shilpa Patka, they uh, co-edited a book titled Intimacy and Injury in the Wake of Me Too in India and South Africa. I will link to the book later uh, so that you can check it out. Uh, the entire series looks fantastic and Manchester Un University Press uh, from all my exchanges with them are good people. So I encourage you to uh, check out their, their books just generally, but especially Srila's books. Uh, because Professor Roy is a very active uh, and accomplished academic, her list of publications and editorships is very, very long. Uh, so I won't go into that. You can check it later uh, via the link I will share. I would just want to mention um, two books. One is Remembering Revolution, uh, which is uh, Professor Roy's uh, first monograph on the gender and sexual politics of India's uh, Naxal Bari movement. And her more re most recent book titled Changing the Subject, Feminist and Queer Politics in Neoliberal India which just came out with Duke University Press a couple of months ago. So today's meeting is not quite the world premiere, but it's very close to being one. Uh, and we're thrilled that you agreed to accept our invitation to talk about uh, your latest publication with us. Um, as I said, it's, it's a joy to have you in the project and we look forward to, to your talk tonight. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Agatha. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I think you can. Um, I, I mean, the, the pleasure and honor is all mine, not just to have this platform to promote my book yet again, <laughs> but also to be part of this amazing, amazing network. I mean, I've really been telling everyone I know about it because, as you said, for, for, for the longest time, I thought of myself as doing something called transnational feminism. And I mean, I'd be curious to hear what everyone thinks about that, actually, what, what that actually means. But I feel like our network for me is the first actual effort to materialize something that is truly transnational and, and feminist and with all of the complexities, a lot of which the burden falls on you, Agatha, but it's just amazing to actually be part of something which is, which is yeah, which is really trying to, I think, materialize possibilities that are, are otherwise have seemed very abstract or even utopian. So, so thank you. I also just want to say to most of the students here that I haven't actually, um, I mean, this was my first year of coming onto the network. So I haven't been part of uh, the, the pedagogical bit of the project. We've been doing other kinds of research uh, activities and I'm just really excited to, you know, to see all of you here. I'm excited you're reading uh, this book or at least a part of it. And, and, and yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. So thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of the book because um, at least for most of you here, I think you've read uh, the introduction, but obviously that doesn't give you, and, and, and I mean, having said that also the overview I will provide will also seem a bit partial and probably a bit abstract. So then hopefully in the discussion, you know, we can, we can, I can maybe make it a little more tangible by providing sort of examples from uh, my case studies. I am a, um, 
I mean, I suppose I am a sociologist, even though I never quite studied it, but that is my discipline. And obviously the work is ethnographic. Um, and yeah, so in the, in the conversation, I can kind of fill in the gaps by giving you more of the story. Okay, so I'm gonna just start by talking about my motivations for writing the book. And I always kind of trace it back to when I was a graduate student in the UK, and that's where I did my master's and my PhD. And I, I sort of came there from India where I, where I was born and I grew up and I did my undergraduate. And it was really, it was, I feel like it was an interesting time, sort of early 2000s, because it felt like a moment where everyone across distinct sites, the North and the South very broadly, uh, we're talking about or expressing a lot of concerns around something called the co-option of feminist politics, right? And in the context of the UK these and the US, these were very much uh, articulated in terms of uh, the institutionalization of women's studies. So how, you know, women's studies was changing perhaps uh, women's movements. And, and, and that was interesting to me because I was in a university in the UK where actually centers of women's studies were under threat. So it was also a kind of precarious institutionalized position anyway. In India, where I came from, co-option uh, debates were, um, were, very, were quite different and they were quite specific. And a lot of them were about the rise of an organizational form, a new organizational form uh, called the NGO, right? And so there were a lot of concerns amongst feminist activists about what it meant for women's movements to become NGOs or NGYs. And obviously I'll unpack that as we go on. Now in the Indian context, the rise of NGOs was a direct fallout of um, a basically a protected economy opening up. So forms of globalization or in local terms, what we call economic liberalization. So, you know, the economy opens up, you have a, you have a flux of funds, uh, also for so, social movement organizing and that kind of changes the terrain of organizing around women's rights and later sexual rights. And the changes to the women's movements are really uh, far reaching. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. Um, oh, I forgot to show you the first slide of the book, but anyway, I'll come back to that, that's the cover. Um, so yeah, so while in um, the 70s, the Indian women's movement was very much associated with uh, with what you would call autonomous women's group who were non-funded, not affiliated to political parties from the 90s with, you know, uh, the, uh, the coming of globalization, what you have is a lot of the same women's group becoming NGOs, becoming reliant on external funds, or you have new NGOs coming into play. And I really like this quote from um, the author and activist Angiti Roy, because I think it really, in, you know, um, hones into some of the anxieties and concerns uh, that feminist activists in particular were feeling. So, you know, uh, she, she says, uh, enjoyization of politics threatens to turn resistance into a well-mannered, salaried, nine-to-five job. Uh, real resistance has real consequences and no salary. Now, while narratives around feminism's co-option, as I said, were, were, were global, the Indian case presented certain additional uh, complexities. So, uh, India's liberalization or economic liberalization not only signaled the co-option and depoliticization of struggles on the one hand, but it also uh, amplified their visibility and vitalization in unexpected ways. So if the Indian women's movement was exemplary of the former trend, uh, allegedly of the former trend, the co-optation and depoliticization, then the queer movement or the sort of um, rise of struggles around sexual rights and sexuality more generally was emblematic of the second move. So here, just to say in terms of broader context, that this moment uh, of liberalization in the 1990s coincided with the global fight against HIV AIDS. And just for those of you who don't know, you know, India was considered after Africa to be, uh, the African continent to be the most at risk of an HIV AIDS crisis pandemic. And so what happened was this whole other channel of funding opened up for organizing around uh, sexual rights. And this was the first time that you have a kind of public emergence of uh, organizing and claims making uh, to the state by sexual supporting groups like sex workers, gay men, or you know, the category of men who have sex with men. And often these claims were made through NGOs and CBOs or community-based organizations. And in fact, the eventual repeal of uh, the anti-sodomy law, which only happened in 2018, can be traced back uh, to, to this moment. 
So basically what I'm trying to suggest that when it comes to, when it came to sexual politics in India, you know, the narratives of depersonalization and co-option, it wasn't as, it wasn't as straightforward. Now in um, 2009, I, I did a, a sort of pilot study which preceded the research that actually formed the basis of this book. And I spoke to a range of um, act uh, feminist, uh, Indian feminist activists, academics, queer activists across major uh, Indian cities. And an older generation of feminists were, were quite skeptical of uh, you know, NGOs. I mean, that's kind of what I was asking at the time. And, I, and I've in fact shared with Agatha uh, quite an early journal article I did, which was really drawing on some of this interview data on the NGOization of the Indian women's movement. Um, so, and, and, and their kind of sentiments very much echoed the, the Roy quote, you know, so, and, and I put uh, one of those up. On the other hand, there was a new generation of uh, professionalized women, indeed many who I were my friends at undergrad. So, you know, it, it, throughout the book, I kind of draw an implicit analogy between academia and NGO spaces, because I think, and I say that right at the start, I think I might have very well ended up in one of these spaces working for women's or sexual rights. So my point is there was also a kind of generational politics at work here where a younger generation of professionalized women were graduating uh, from universities, from higher education and moving into these spaces. But they seem to be haunted by this idea of, you know, what is real resistance or what is real feminist um, or what is a real feminist. And finally, I have a quote from a queer activist in Delhi who said to me, you let loose an idea that's beyond your control, everything gets co-opted. So the book effectively locates itself in the struggle between being autonomous and being co-opted or between being um, free or and caught. And I, what, what it tries to do is, is offer a different way of thinking about feminism's co-option in the context of you know, uh, global neoliberalism by instead thinking of feminism's entanglement in forms of uh, power. So first, unlike arguments that tend to divide feminist struggles into ones that are co-opted and ones that are not, feminism, the book suggests, is always already co-opted and not outside of power. And to this extent, the book theorizes feminism as a governmentality in its own right, which is not the same as governance. And we could talk about that a bit more. I mean, I'm just reflecting on some of the rich questions that I, I saw or had the privilege to see. So uh, the book theorizes feminism as a governmentality in its own right, as a conduct of conduct in the broadest possible sense, as a way of governing society and the self. So the book understands feminism as a technology of the self, as a way of making uh, or, or affording the conditions for making the self. Uh, and it shows you know, through the ethnographic data, how feminism affords the tools to craft a new kind of self and a new way of life. And it also suggests that it, it is perhaps to the scale of the self that we should turn uh, to sense its radical potential. And I make that argument specifically of contexts like post-colonial contexts like India and others have made it of um, a similar context where the self has never really been taken seriously as a site of uh, political change or social transformation. And, and again, I'll be happy to speak more about that. So as a technology of both governance and of the self, feminism, one could say, is always co-opted, but also always a creative and transformative force in the world. Finally, the specificities of feminist organizing and self-making in the global South are not reducible to global uh, neoliberal logic. So here the book tries to push against overestimations of the impact of neoliberalism by tracing longer shifts in the logics and techniques of governing gendered, racialized, or sexualized subjects in the global South, as well as for grounding complex lineages of Indian feminist thought and practice, which I, I, I suggest together constitute a history of contemporary queer and non-queer Indian feminism. So my uh, ethnographic site, which is the Eastern state of uh, West Bengal, lent very nicely to a study of uh, you know, mixed genealogies or, or quite rich political um, lineages, and not least because the state has been quite unusual in the history of contemporary India. It had a 34 uh, long uninterrupted communist rule, which ended in 2011. And even though that's, it's a while since it ended, 
the left is a very palpable force in the state and in its capital city of uh, Kolkata, which was formerly called Calcutta. So, uh, I, and I'll, I'll sort of say more about how the left kind of seeps in into my ethnography, even though the organizations I was in, I was sort of observing had nothing to do with the official left. So they weren't part of left political parties or the like. Um, so the book draws on a decade long ethnography of two organizations located in this area. The first organization is Suffolk Equality, which is a queer feminist organization. It's, uh, it, it's fairly metropolitan. Uh, and it started off as a small support group for uh, working on uh, mostly cisgender, lesbian, bisexual women, and sort of later expanding into trans rights. And it, in the in the course of my time, it became a lot more accomplished, a lot you know, it expanded in scale, becoming a much more fully funded NGO. The other organization that I call uh, Janam is representative of those NGOs that came into being after uh, you know the decade of um, the, the UN the Women's Decade ended with Beijing in 1995, and these uh, NGOs are sometimes called Beijing Babies. And this organization is much more uh, emblematic of, uh, you know, a lot of like sort of global women's empowerment work, which which, which basically tries to do that through women's access, uh, through women's financial independence, largely through access to credit, which is called microfinance. The, the slight difference with Janam is that it combines microfinance with doing anti-violence activism. So it combines this idea of women's financial independence with a strong uh, belief in women's rights. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how their actual work happens. Um, uh, Janam, uh, unlike Sappho for Equality, which is, which is metropolitan, works in the urban areas. Janam works in uh, neighboring, peri urban and rural areas. And I just want to make it clear that I wasn't looking at the impact of these organizations. I wasn't trying to assess um, you know, how, how they were doing their work or how they were impacting the communities they work with. I mean, mostly I was interviewing the various players within the organization in various capacities, whether they were activists, whether they were paid employees, uh, partially paid and so on and so forth. Now, it might, be, uh, it might seem strange that I've placed together a queer and a non-queer feminist organization. And, and of course, as in some other contexts, you know, queer feminists or queer women have found non-queer feminists to be quite homophobic and, have, and as providing them with only sort of conditional forms of acceptance. But in the Indian context, uh, in part because of the HIV AIDS uh, crisis, where the lesbian was completely invisible to the state and to transnational circuits of funding, uh, lesbian women or, or early lesbian organizing relied much more on the Indian women's movement than on, uh, you know, um, a gay community. So, so part of what the book also tries to show is how the queer and the non-queer feminists are deeply intertwined in this context and what might be, you know, the implications of that entanglement. Okay, so um, I'm happy to talk more about uh, methodology, but I did want to say that as it must be obvious that Suffolk Equality is the actual name of the organization. I chose not to anonymize or provide it with a pseudonym because it would be far too recognizable, but everyone in the book has been given a pseudonym. Um, I, I'm familiar with this, this locale because of you know my own positionality, this is the region I come from, but I haven't lived there for very long. And also because I did, the research for my former book there. And, and just very finally to say that the book took far longer, the research took far longer than it was supposed to, it took 10 years of my life. But as a result, uh, because of that long delay, I was able to see things that I, I think I wouldn't have been able to see. I mean, certainly at the time, for those of you who may not know, uh, you know, India went through a massive shift when it came to LGBT rights. You know, the Indian courts decriminalized, recriminalized, and finally decriminalized um, sodomy in this kind of short period. And even before the laws changed, there was a huge transformation, at least in metropolitan India, with, with, in terms of the visibility of queer communities, queer individuals, and a kind of general uh, uh, acceptance, which also the book tries to unpack about like, you know, who is, who is being accepted and in what terms uh, in a queer, queer friendly India as it were. Okay, so uh, moving on to sort of what, what I found, right? What, you know, what, what I observed over these 10 years. So throughout the book, I show the transformations to activism in processes of enjoyization. And that includes a kind of scalar expansion from the local to the transnational, the prof its professionalization, the professionalization of activism, 
and the promotion of certain selves and modalities of working on the self. Uh, and I'll come back to that. But one of the crucial arguments I make is that these transformations were not reducible to, or, or the, the sort of consequences of these transformations were not reducible to the dynamics of NGOization or transnational and neoliberal conjunctures alone. And I think that's important to stress because we often think of NGOs and NGOization as signaling the, uh, the, you know, the, the hand of the West, like something external coming in and uh, you know, polluting a local context. And the book actually tries really hard to reorient our gaze to the local. And instead suggests that in this moment of NGOization, what I at least found is, is the in endurance of space and time, of the local and of histories, which are very particular, you know, feminist histories, particular to the Indian context. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But just to say that um, Sappho for Equality and Janam, the two organizations, employed a range of governmental techniques, some of which were straightforwardly global and neoliberal, like microcredit, but others that, as I said, just evoked these much longer histories, more embedded histories of governing, especially subaltern women. I mean, a, a, a quick way of explaining that is, you know, poor rural women in these locales. Both organizations relied, for instance, on forms of consciousness raising that were themselves product of mixed genealogies from the local left to participatory development to human rights. And like I said before, and I show in specific chapters how, you know, the left sort of informed everything from the aesthetics, the orientations, the sensibilities of various actors whose personal biographies had no, um, no, no real link to the, uh, to the left. I also show how what I, what I call in the book queer feminist governmentalities of the present were haunted by past feminisms, by the historical structures of knowing and feeling that shape the contours of post-colonial politics, both leftist and feminist. So here, just to tell you a little bit about the post-independent Indian women's movement. This was a movement that really came into its own as a new social movement in the 1970s, but it has older uh, origins in the, the national liberation struggle. So in the nationalist uh, colonial movement. And those th that origin or, you know, those kind of, um, terms very much continued in the post-colonial period. So it did, in the post-colonial period, you know, from, uh, I mean, the, the, the period of the 50s is considered like a quiet period. So the period of the 70s, uh, the Indian women's movement demanded rights and development from the Indian state on behalf of a category of Indian woman, a category which seemed to be completely non-intersectional, so unmarked by class, caste, religion, or sexuality. And remember for in the post the peculiarities of the post-colonial is that often the women's movements or feminism was dismissed as something Western or alien or bourgeois. So part of the burden of not just this women's movement, but women's movements also in the Middle East and elsewhere in the global South was to try and uh, legitimize itself and, and, and make itself seem legible in local terms. And one of the ways it did that was to constantly say that we are speaking on behalf of, you know, the subject of uh, feminist politics, which is the poor masses, right? So that's so. So just to make it really concrete, here was a movement which was quite urban. The most visible, recognizable section of it was sort of urban, middle class, upper class, educated, professionalized women. But the ways in which they would accrue to themselves forms of legitimacy and recognition was by saying that we are speaking on behalf of are less you know, fortunate uh, sisters. And why I'm making this point is because that's one of the dynamics that I see uh, continuing in this much later period, even post globalization. And even in the hands of sort of a new generation of lesbian or queer feminist activists who actually uh, you know, broke away from the, this previous generation. And if that sounds complicated, I can, you know, we can talk about that. So, um, why, yeah, so while these dynamics of, you know, this kind of speaking on behalf of poor women had a direct bearing on how poverty came to be prioritized over the politics of sexuality, I show how they endured in a neoliberal conjuncture, which presented activists and organizers with paradoxical possibilities. So in the face of accusations of angelization and co-option, activists turned to the past in more, uh, often in quite defensive ways. So Janam, for instance, 
mobilized ideas, you know, these, these past ideas of uh, autonomous activism against accusations of NGOization, while you're also using this rhetoric to justify the low payment of poor rural uh, development workers. A SAFO for equality in turn, I show created divisions between themselves as politicized queers and more vulnerable lesbians, lesbians who were mainly in rural areas and who were uh, poorer than they were, and often treated them in slightly paternal and moralizing ways. And these were just some of the ways in which, uh, you know, these uh, organizers, activists, reproduced historical inequalities and exclusions, especially along the lines of caste and class in the Indian context. So rather than co-option, what the book I think tries to show is how NGOization recalibrates an existing terrain, which is already marked by a lot of unequal power relations amongst women. And, and that's why I sort of start the book by constantly thinking about, you know, who is, who is the we of feminist politics and trying throughout the book to show, you know, how hard it is to, I mean, even, I mean, not just to imagine, but definitely to mobilize that because of all these internal differences and hierarchies. And, and I feel like in some ways, we're quite comfortable of thinking about that in terms of the West and the rest of the world, but not internal to places within the global South. Okay, so, but ultimately I hope that the book does not just offer a critical take. Um, as I said at the start, the flip side of what I call governmentality is the government of the self, which also helps us to reorient more kind of top-down ways of looking at, um, well, top-down sort of uh, rhetorics around governance, et cetera, to the terrain of the self, self-making, subjectivity. My uh, interlocutors in this book were, were were quite ambiguously positioned. So they were sometimes target groups like, you know, a queer community, but they were also activists themselves. They were, um, in, in the case of Janam, they were both a beneficiary of Janam's development work, but they were also often the agents themselves who actually undertook this work. But ultimately what they were, were instruments of queer feminist governmentality who were incited to empower the self for governing or empowering others. And the ways that were done would be through trainings and consciousness raising, uh, a lot of like gender training. So, so these were like sort of groups of uh, women, uh, queer folk who were all trained to empower uh, others, right, in the community. But basically what the book argues is that these kind of um, technologies of the self, as I call them, were much more about ultimately about empowering the self than they were about empowering the other. So development and activist spaces proved far more productive for individuals to work on, to care for and transform the self than they did to empower the other. So I show, for instance, how uh, queer and non-queer feminist organizing served as an unprecedented and uh, unexpected site for transforming the self. So some of the individuals I spoke to spoke of, of huge amounts of um, huge amounts of self-transformation. So this is an image from the field of a rural development worker. And these are their words where they say, I don't know how to put it into words, but I used to be someone and now I'm someone else. So they spoke about enormous amounts of personal transformation, right? And some of this personal transformation was rooted in the kind of changes they were exposed to in the organizations, like I said, through forms of consciousness raising or gender, gender training. And changes to the self manifested in everything from uh, how one dressed to what one ate, to what one aspired to for oneself or one's friends and one's families. And self-making took the form of quite embodied and aesthetic practices, which were not only an engagement with gender and sexual norms, but also uh, class and caste ones. And just a very final point about self-making is I try very hard to not posit this terrain of making the self as one of resistance to governmentalities, right? So I, I try and show how um, self-making was often, uh, you know, amenable to um, what we today think of as like neoliberal or post-feminist uh, self-making. So for instance, uh, for the, these rural development workers, empowerment often meant the freedom to wear jeans, or to ride a bicycle, forms of mobility which are really not available to them in rural India, right? Uh, but that's not how the NGO imagined empowerment at all. 
So the point is not to say that you know uh, the the way you transform the self is necessarily in a very feministy way. I mean that's that's not it. Actually, the book tries to show how that terrain is also quite is also quite messy, right? But at the very least, it's to suggest that in this context of uh, you know whatever you want to call it, like neoliberal development or even neoliberal feminism, if we only look at what's happening in the at the organizational stage and not look at these this this other stuff that is happening in the terrain of the personal, then we might, you know, we might sort of be limited in our understanding. Okay, um, I'm going to now do just a quick um, uh, a breakdown of each chapter. Agatha, how am I doing for time? Okay, good. Yeah, good. Like five more minutes. If you okay, wish. cool. Yeah, yeah. So just a quick um, summary of the chapters. So the first two chapters uh, make a case for turning from co-option to entanglement. I suggest that entanglement offers uh, uh, a head-on way of dealing with the contradictions and, and the tensions of the moment, while reminding us that feminism's proximity to power is not newly experienced, and especially not in the global south, where you know, we've had a whole history of imperial feminisms at work and so on and so forth. The chapters that follow uh, are the kind of main heart of the book, which draw on the ethnography. So I start uh, in the chapter called Queer Activism as Governmentality. I start with the story of Sappho, which began as a small support group, as I said, and then has become a much more recognizable, established NGO. And right through the chapter, I try and show how the conditions that institutionalized and expanded activism, which includes globalization, new digital technologies, and urban neoliberal economy, also created new regimes of uh, or new forms of hierarchies and exclusions. And these are perhaps best summarized by a trans feminist activist who once uh, said of the Sapphire for Equality activists, uh, they keep looking for the grassroots and for the Dalit. Dalit means former untouchable in the Indian context. And here we are right in front of them. But the chapter ends by showing how trans and queer feminisms were all actually um, locked in the same kind of logic and and, and neoliberal funding often meant that they were in a bit of a competition uh, to, uh, around the question of who could most represent uh, the sexual subaltern. So, uh, so the chapter tries to also move away from this linear way of thinking of non-queer feminists, queer feminists, and then trans feminists by actually showing how these are much more um, simultaneous histories. In the following chapter, I, I turn much more to stories of queerness as lived in the context of contemporary uh, Kolkata. I uh, interview younger Sapphire for Equality members, both cisgender and transgender, who were some of the first to live openly out of the closet. And who chose to come out of the closet and under what conditions reveals sharply intersectional questions. In the case of one uh, Dalit, again, former untouchable as a uh, Sapphire for Equality activist, I, we see how it is, it's easier for someone to come out as gay than to come out as Dalit in this milieu. So one of the arguments that the chapter makes is how queerness relies, or a visible radical queerness relies on class caste privilege, even as it disrupts gender and sexual hierarchies. Um, from queer governmentality, the book turns to feminist governmentality, which are shown to be a quite a complex terrain of developing subaltern women, uh, which includes genealogies from uh, the state, uh, transnational development, the local left, and so on and so forth. Oh, and rather, and especially current global efforts to sort of um, marry neoliberal development with women's rights. But in the case of this NGO that I call Janam, I show how these efforts were fought with contradictions and tensions and how the local community of you know, poor rural women constantly sort of fracture and bring these uh, incompatibilities. So the, incom the fundamental incompatibility between saying, you know, we're going to give women access to money through credit and we're going to uphold their rights. So they constantly sort of bring, bring this to its limit. So the end of that chapter, I show how in, in this very concrete instance of uh, the NGO trying to save a young woman from child marriage, I show how the, the broader community of women reject these efforts to be rescued and, you know, and how that kind of brings feminist governmentalities to their limit, even marking their failure. But as I said before, that these rural development women were not just the beneficiaries of 
development and rights. So in another kind of um, emblematic form of neoliberal development, they were also the agents on the ground. So they were trained by the NGO and then they were sent out into communities to do everything from you know, talking to rural, local women about education, child marriage, anti-violence, et cetera, et cetera. And it is fair to say that it was these women who were considered as volunteers and not employees by the organization, so they were paid very poorly, who stood most empowered in contrast to the wider community of women. And I show how in the intimate lives of uh, rural development workers, empowerment translated into previously unavailable forms of individualism, uh, new forms of intersubjectivity, conjugality, consumption, care. And again, these were the narratives that enabled me to make a one of the major claims of the book, which was how you know, these were spaces far more about caring for and transforming the self than uh, empowering the other, which was a, a project that was often you know, doomed to failure. Okay, just finally in the conclusion to the book, so I just kind of want to step back here and say, you know, right through the book, I, I worried a lot about its more critical <laughs> interventions, right? And I worried about how uh, this community of NGO workers or activists who are very much part of, you know, the lived uh, community of like radical um, left-leaning people in the city, I worried about how they would, they, they would receive my more critical, uh, you know, reflections in the book or critical analysis. And so in the book's conclusion, what I try to do is take this, take my anxiety a bit head on and talk about what it means for academics to produce critique of activist or NGO work. And I try and uh, revisit the focus of critique and offer a different orientation or, or you know, try to think about a different orientation towards critique in the notion of critique as care. And I resurrect a more expansive role of the critic who practices a form of letting go to care for the self and the world anew. Uh, I turn quite briefly in the conclusion to some new forms of protest that have happened in India against the authoritarian politics of uh, Modi as a way of showing the diverse, incomplete, and quite contradictory ways in which feminist subjects are made and are making themselves in times of upheaval and crisis. And ultimately, I suggest that this is where our work as academics or activists should begin in assumptions of impurity, messiness, and entanglement rather than in purity, cleanliness, and freedom. For feminists in India and elsewhere, this might mean staying with the uncertainty and ambivalence of projects of self and world making, rather than accepting the closure of co-option as a way of maintaining our own attachments to proper feminist subjects and desirable feminist futures. Okay, I'm gonna end there. Thank you.